Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom our hearts and our minds rest, our spirits are with Him. We are set in His place and we have great hope because we have a promise that our bodies will one day experience everything that we hope in. Right now we, we're, we're pulled this way and that way and, and we know that Paul talks about that flesh, how Satan loves to just tear at our flesh. But we have a hope that one day our whole being will be where we have set our minds. So grace to you and peace from that God. We have uh, we began a, a, short, a short series of lessons last week on recovering our why for worship. Why do we worship? Why are we even here right now? And, and I've, I've heard lessons about why you, you should worship. And, and I think you could, I could right now make a case from Scripture. We worship because God says to worship. He says so, and that's all the reason you need. Just worship because God says so. And that would be true in a sense. But, but I'm telling you, if, if that's all we have for worship, worship is going to become a very empty and powerless ritual. If I just do it because God said so, and that's it, and that's all. Worship is meant to be packed with meaning. Like, like real relevant meaning. When we come to worship, there's something here that's not anywhere else. And, and our lives are different going from here because of that. And it means something to us. If I could say it this way, if my Monday through Saturday life would carry on right now just as it is, whether or whether or not I worshipped God, that says something about my worship. Because worship should change us. Worship should impact us. And so why are we here? What is that impact? What is that meaning that we find here in this place beyond, well, we ought to do it because God said we ought to do it. So I'm not going to preach a series of lessons on worshiping because God said so. Uh, we want to recover our why. Why am I here? What does this mean to me? How does this impact me? Are there any reasons, any compelling reasons for worship? And, and yeah, I think there are. Last week we talked about our salvation as a motivation and as a reason for worship. Remember where you came from. Remember that you have been pulled out of a pit. And we said this, that we will worship when we remember our salvation. We will naturally turn and worship the Savior when we know we've been saved. I mean really know it. Don't just know a fact about Jesus dying for our sins, but personally I know that means me. That I was pulled out of a pit and I have a Savior. I naturally turn my heart to worship a, a Savior when I know that I've been saved. Uh, we, we, we read this psalm, had it not been the Lord that was on our side. Do I know that? That if it had not been the Lord on my side, I was a goner. I had no hope. I was dead. I was done for. But blessed be the Lord who did not give us up. Naturally flowing into worship when I remember had it not been the Lord that was on our side. Today I want to talk about a second reason for worship. And, and I'm reminded of a story about Martin Luther King Jr. He told this story in his autobiography. Because when, when Martin Luther, he was born in the 30s in Atlanta. And, and when he was going to school kind of in his teenage years, the schools were all segregated. And so he had to get on a bus every single morning to go across to the west side of Atlanta where he would go to Booker T. Washington High School there in Atlanta. And the schools were segregated. The buses were segregated. So there was a certain number of rows on the front end of the bus for the white people and then on the back end of the bus for the black people. And they were segregated. And, and it was that way whether or not there were a lot of people on the bus. Many times there wouldn't be very many white people on the bus, and yet the black people still had to go to the back. And if they could find a seat, great. Many times they stood as they looked over empty seats that they could be sitting in. Martin Luther, Jr. Said, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said this. He said, I would end up having to go to the back of that bus with my body. But every time I got on that bus, I left my mind up on the front seat. And I said to myself, one of these days, I'm going to put my body up there where my mind is. I like that. I'm putting my mind up on that front seat. And one day, my body is going to be right up there where my mind is. 
The Christian hope, very simply put, is this, that one day we're going to put our bodies up where our mind is. Our minds and our hearts are set in a place right now that I've been looking over empty seats all my life. I've been looking over empty seats all my life from the back of this bus. I look to a promise that one day there's going to be no tears while I sit back here and I hurt and I suffer frustrations. But I look up there where my mind is. I look to a promise of one day every single knee will bow while back here I look around and evil people are prospering all around. But one day every knee will bow. I look to a place I look to a place that my body is not experiencing as of yet. To the promise that the Messiah will save me from my sins. And I wish He would hurry up with that. Because there's sometimes I just despise what I do. <laughs> Understand, He has saved me already from the, the penalty of my sins. I know my eternity is secure. But I'm still in them. I mean, I need deliverance out of these things. And, and I look forward to promises that as of yet, it's a hope. It's a hope. And I know my body is going to one day be where my mind is and where my heart is. That's what Christian hope is. I believe, I believe the promises. I've set my mind where the promises are. I just can't wait to the day that He puts my body where my mind is. That's Christian hope. In Colossians 3, a couple of scriptures, one in Colossians 3, one in Philippians 3. Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not things that are on earth. Your mind, take it and put it where Christ is in the throne room of God. Philippians 3, Paul starts out talking about the negative here in Philippians 3 about verse 19. He talks about people that have their minds set on earthly things. They're enemies of the cross. But then he says, us, but us, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body. This is how the Christian lives his life, with his citizenship in heaven, with his mindset where Jesus is above, with assurance that one day this body is going to follow where my mind is. And what we're talking about here is hope. This is Christian hope, that the things we see by faith we will one day experience in the body. That's hope. And critical to our Christian hope is a consistent practice of worship. Your worship and your hope go hand in hand. They cannot be moved apart from one another. Your hope and your worship, your worship and your hope, you, you build up your hope in worship. You, you hold on to your hope in worship. And the more committed you are to worship, the more convinced you are of your hope. There's a direct correlation between Christian hope and Christian worship, the two naturally must go together. But because here's what we're doing. When we come together and worship, and, and we're in this, this atmosphere of support and encouragement and accountability, I'm here with you, you're here with me, we're all right here in front of each other where we see and we hear what each other are doing. We, we get into that situation and together we commit ourselves to hope. I stand in front of you, you stand in front of me, and together we proclaim, I still believe it. I tell you what I believe. You tell me what, I, what you believe. That's what we're doing in worship. We together are committing ourselves to hope. I believe it. What do you say in worship? You say things like, I believe that God is the highest, that He is the greatest. You say things like, I believe that He loves me. You proclaim it with your lips. I believe that Jesus loves me. I believe that God cares for me. I believe that His ways are best, and so I commit myself to His ways. I believe He's coming again to make all things right. I believe that my relationships are better with Him in them. I believe that my finances are better with Him in them. I believe that He has an answer to every single thing I'm going through right now, and I trust Him. We proclaim these things in front of one another in an atmosphere of support and accountability. And we, our hope swells as we worship. You see how that works? 
as I hear myself saying that I believe these things. And you know what? We all deal with doubts. There might be something deep down inside myself that yeah, I kind of doubt the proclamations I'm making, but still there's power in it that I'm pulling myself to believe what I proclaim here with my brothers and sisters. We commit ourselves to hope in worship. And this is absolutely critical. This is absolutely critical. Without our worship, our hope would shrivel and our lives would shrivel. If we did not have worship to hold on to, we would be shriveled up half people. I don't know if we really realize this, how much worship really holds our lives together. What we would be if it were not for worship. What our lives would look like. This, uh, look, let's look at Philippians 3. I, I want to look at, back again to that text that we just read uh, on the negative side. Because I, I think Paul is kind of setting two camps there in front of us. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are worshipers. But if we were not worshipers, what would we be? Let's look at Philippians 3.19. This is what we would be apart from worship. This is what's at stake. In Philippians 3.19 he talks about uh, people who are enemies of the cross. And he gives some characteristics of that. Uh, the first one is their end is destruction. They don't have a hope of eternal life like you and I do. We know we are moving towards something good. Like the whole story of our life has a good ending. And it ends in eternal life. They don't have that. They're, in, they're slowly moving towards doom. He said, their God is in their belly. Their God is in their belly. You know, I, <laughs> I see some smiles around here. Sometimes we get dangerously close to having that God in the belly. Well, this is a poetic way of saying they serve their appetites. They serve their desires. He's not just talking about food here. Their sexual appetites, their financial appetites, whatever they want, that's what they worship. They worship their desires. Their God is in their belly. What would my life look like if I didn't have worship? I guarantee you one thing, I would serve my desires. I would worship my appetites. In worship we remind ourselves. We remind ourselves that His way is life. That things like forgiveness and kindness and grace, and self-restraint, self-control, sacrifice. These are good things. God is worthy of worship, and His ways are life. We recall and we plant ourselves in these things when we worship. It's hard to worship God and praise Him for being loving without also wanting to be loving myself. When I praise God and say, your love is a great thing, it is wonderful, it is a most high way, it's hard to say that and then go out there and live like I shouldn't be loving. It's hard to praise Him for His forgiveness and then go out and be unforgiving. You understand, when we, when we praise Him, we remind ourselves, oh yes, I'm committed to those ways, not my desires, not my appetites. In worship, we, we move our affections to what is good and what is true. Paul says this, he says, they glory in their shame. Which, which raises the question, what are you proud of? What kind of things do you brag about? Have you ever heard somebody bragging about things that you knew they should have been ashamed of? You ever, you ever hear this? And I, I think of like <coughs> stupid frat boy kind of things. Oh, you wouldn't believe what I did when I was hammered last night. Are you bragging about things. Dude, you ought to be ashamed of that. You won't believe what I did with my girlfriend last night. I don't want to hear about that. That's not something we want to talk about. You won't believe me. I was in Walmart the other day and what I stuck in my pocket and they never found out. You know, stupid stuff like that. Bragging about things you ought to be ashamed of. Those are obvious. It, it actually it gets a little more nuanced even than that. You ever heard somebody practically bragging about their hard heart? It might sound something like, yeah, she's crazy if she thinks I'm ever forgiving her. She's getting what she deserves. What are you doing? You're bragging about how unforgiving you are. Or maybe, come look at my expensive collection of stuff that has no purpose and I'm never going to use. Even though you know I, you never give anything for the poor. Bragging about how selfish and how self-centered I am. We, we can fall into this trap of glorying in our shame. Paul says they glory in their shame. They are so unaware of what is shameful that they actually brag about it. But, but a worshiper of God, on the other hand, 
consistently holds up and adores that which is truly glorious. Consistently proclaims, no, these things are shameful and these things hold true glory, the things of God. That's what we do in worship. And we train our minds and our hearts to know what is praiseworthy when we worship. Paul says, I boast, I brag in my weaknesses. I boast in the Lord. I boast in my trials. Those things, there are some, those things that the world looks at in me and says, oh, those are impressive. No, those are rubbish. I just want to know the Lord. And you see this true worshiper, Paul, he knows what to glory in. He knows what to brag about. Don't glory in your shame. Glory in God and worship. Worshipers know what's worth bragging about. Worship fuels our hope in this way. Last thing Paul says, he says, they have their minds set on earthly things. Philippians 3.19, they have their minds set on earthly things. Their eyes are looking down and not up. And honestly, this doesn't, I don't think, have anything to do with subject matter. It can. There are earthly subjects to, to fixate on. But I think this goes to anything and everything we might think about. It's not so much about the subject that I'm thinking about. It's the posture of my heart as I'm thinking about it. I'll give you an example. When it comes to school, we got some students in here. When I think about my schoolwork, how do I think about it? Do I think about it with my eyes looking down or with my eyes looking up? Do I, do I think about my academics as in, how exactly am I going to show that I'm good enough? How exactly am I going to get ahead? How exactly am I going to provide for myself? Because you've got to take care of yourself. How exactly am I going to do enough to make the people around me happy? Or when I think about my academics, do I, do I have an upward mindset that says, that says, what is God gifting me for? How is God filling me and walking me through this academic career in a way that He's going to use me and, and, and He's going to provide for me? How is God guiding me through this thing? You understand, we're, we're thinking about the same thing, my schoolwork and, and such, but are my eyes down on earthly things or are my eyes up on heavenly things? Am I looking down or am I looking up? In worship itself, we can do this. As I think about worship, is my mindset on earthly things or is my mindset on heavenly things? Man, I don't sound that great. What do people around me think? What does the other church down the road think? Am, am I on key? Do I sound good? Are we doing enough traditional things? Are we doing enough new things? You know, all these kind of things that we worry about. Or, or do I have a mind, upward mindset that says, I'm just here to be with God. I love Him. I adore Him. I'm here in His presence to tell Him that I love Him and to hear His love back to me. Is my mindset on earthly things or is it on heavenly things? True, wor true worshipers. True worshipers have their minds set on things of God. So when your, your, your citizenship, when your citizenship is in heaven, you train yourself into a consistent practice of taking your mind and your heart to the place where Jesus is. You increasingly look up in your life, and that's your source of hope. That fuels your hope. And the more that you hope, the more you worship. And, and it's this, this cycle of life here where we come to Him again and again, and we proclaim these things. My God is not my desires. My God is the creator of heaven and earth. I fix my eyes on what is good and what is lovely, and I glory in those things. I don't glory in the shameful things of this world, the shameful things of my desires. I lift my eyes up instead of dragging them along the ground. And, and you do these things, you'll become a person of greater hope. You'll become a person of greater strength, a person of greater joy, a person that God can use because you're secure. And so you can be a person that strengthens others. That's what happens when we fuel our hope here in worship. That's why we're here to worship, because we are committed to hope. If you would please pray with me. Father God, our hope is in you. Our hope is not in our strength, our fleshly strength, the things that fail, the things that certainly shameful. Father, we hope in your glory and in your ways. We worship you. We hold you up as the one who is highest, who is love, who is truth, who is goodness. We hold you up as the one that we want to be more like. 
and we hold you up as our Savior. We know that we have eternal life. We know that all your promises are true. That even as we sit back here in our flesh that is attacked by Satan day in and day out, your promises are true. We proclaim it. We believe it. And we know that one day our bodies will be where our minds and our spirits and our hearts are as we set them on you. So, Father God, we hope in you. And we pray that as you bring us into this place week after week, as you go with us day after day in this thing that we call worship, where we love you and we adore you and we look to you and we hear from you, our worship. Father, we pray that in our worship you would be building up our hope. And as we come to hope more in you, we would come more and more into your presence to worship. Father, we pray that this cycle of life you would create and grow in each and every one of us here. And Father, we, we do deal with so many things in our life. Father, we pray that you would be present with us everywhere that we go. And that you would be shining your light through us everywhere that we go. Now, Father, we pray as a church family. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.